Добрый день, друзья. Рад вас всех приветствовать. Сегодня у нас такой замечательный день. У нас в гостях господин Стюарт Лоусон с лекцией, которая будет состоять из двух частей. Сегодня первая и через неделю вторая. Я думаю, что никому не нужно дополнительно что-то рассказывать о этом человеке, потому что он крайне интересный, человек с колоссальным опытом, уже по итогам предыдущих наших встреч, зарекомендовавший себя как очень интересный лектор. Соответственно, не буду больше занимать ваше время, скажу лишь, что эта лекция была организована сообществом молодых лидеров ГЛОБ при поддержке Международного института управления при поддержке клуба «Экономикус» и практического клуба. Соответственно, дальше слово мистеру Лобсону. Ваше слово. Спасибо. Вау, здесь много вас. Добрый вечер. Очень рад видеть вас всех. Мой имя Стюарт Лорсон. Я буду тратить столько, сколько вы хотите, до какого-то момента, говорить о рисках. Actually, what I'd really like to do is talk a bit broader than risk. Uh, really, risk is just an excuse to talk about, you know, stuff that I know about leadership, business, uh, a little bit about business perhaps in Russia, a little bit about business around the world. So I'm, I've got a PowerPoint presentation. I probably won't get through it, uh, but I don't think that's important. What's important is we get into a dialogue, because the worst thing for me would be to stand here and lecture to you. That's not the plan. What I really want is an opportunity to get into a conversation with you and find out what you're interested in talking about so that we can talk about that. Actually, for a start, I don't really like this. Does any, is there an audio technical guy around? I'd much rather walk around. Listen, can you all hear me? Can, yeah. can you hear me in the back? Yeah, yeah okay, because I'd much rather do that than stand behind a, 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 a pedestal there. So, uh, for those of you that weren't around, Uh, last time I was uh, uh, talking, I've been a banker for 35 years. Uh, 25 years at Citibank in 11 countries, and uh, for the last 10, uh, 15 years, I've been in Russia, uh, CEO of four banks, uh, Citibank, HSBC, and a couple of Russian banks. Uh, and during the time that I was at Citibank, I spent probably about 15 years being a crisis manager. And, and you might wonder what a crisis manager is. Well, in, in a way, it's self-explanatory. It's when you get to manage crisis. Um, it was essentially when Citibank had a problem somewhere in the world, uh, and it started in Kenya, and it sort of worked its way through Egypt, Norway, Italy, and the UK. Basically, when they had a problem uh, and the portfolio was falling apart, they asked me to go in. Uh, normally, I was the only management change they made, and I'd go in and I'd try and take control of the environment try and come up with a plan and execute the plan. So one of the things that we can talk about is what does it take when uh, things get uncertain? What do you have to do? What are the sort of tips of the trade? I hope that you, you don't all end up being crisis managers because that would be a little worrying. Um, but what I do hope is that some of these lessons that I've had, uh, I can pass on to you. Really, if you've been in business as long as I have, it's really it's the, the most important thing that I can do over the next however long, five, ten years, is try and take some of the stuff that I've learned and hand it off to you guys. But let me start with a couple of sort of general things. It's extremely important to fail. <laughs> you know why? Anybody know why it's important to fail? Anybody got an idea why it's important to fail? It's always a refreshing experience. It's a refreshing experience, like a brushing your teeth. Yeah. You can learn from your mistakes. Sorry? You can learn from your own mistakes. Right, that's the one. You, you, you've got to learn from your own mistakes. You've got to find a way to cycle the information. I can tell you, because I, this was the problem for me. You, no. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a problem for me, which was uh, that I was extremely successful for a long enough period of time that actually when I was unsuccessful, I fell a long way. Everybody fails. There's nobody that I know. Steve Jobs failed and then came back and succeeded, <laughs> kind of well, actually. But the, everybody in business fails at some point. And the trick is how much you learn of it, how much you learn from your mistakes, how you take that experience and improve <coughs> the next time around. So, you know, what I would ask you to do is fail a little bit and learn a lot. 
Uh, now, the other thing, I think, is, is that you don't need to know day one what you're going to be. What you do need to know is what you want to achieve inside yourself, and you have to, f and you have to set up these goals. And be sure that you're great at what you're doing. Don't have your eye on the job after next. If you have your eye on the job after next, well, you won't be very good at this one. And one of the things that I used to really get on my nerves when I was hiring people, which I did a lot of over the last 16 years, is that there's a danger that you see CVs that look as though the most important thing that person has ever done is write their CV. So what happens is that you change job every two years, you don't pick up any skills, but by heavens, you're the vice president in charge of corporate strategic planning. But you don't know what that means, but you're the vice president. Now, it's important to find areas where you can actually acquire the skills that you'll need, especially as you start off. So that as you develop more and more responsibility, you acquire more skills. Careers are definitely not, you can see I'm not really talking about risk management, I'm sorry. I will actually get there, don't worry. Uh, careers are not, you start here and you end there. Careers are all about moments. There are moments of, of plateaus where things don't look as though they're moving forward. And there's moments when you, 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 you get promoted, you get more responsibilities, followed by other moments of plateaus. And then occasionally, as happened to me, there are moments when you slide off the, the cliff. Uh, and, then, and then it's a question of what you've got inside you. Another of my favorite sayings is, it's not how you fall down, it's how you pick yourself up. Because, again, it's this business of learning from your mistakes. I suppose I better get into strategic risk management. But at some point, I want to get back to these general things. Because it's the general things that are really interesting to me and maybe to you. So let's start by talking about risk. I'm not very good at this. This is a new coin. Hang on. Heads or tails? Okay, this is the way it works. Hands up for those people that want heads. About 50%. Okay. Uh, okay, remember who you are, please. Ready? Ready? That was heads. Now, heads or tails? No, no, no. Just the heads guys get to put their hands up, because that way we can visually follow them. How many heads, guys? Oh, a little bit less than the last time. Okay. Heads or tails? Heads, guys. <laughs> ah, not quite so many. Okay, now let's just do one other thing. Now let's add a little incentive. A hundred rubles from each of you on the next flip. Those people that bet correctly get the hundred rubles from those people that don't. <laughs> okay, now, now I have to say, this is a Russian university, so I expect somebody to say, well, can't we bet a thousand dollars? But, uh, but we'll, we'll stick with a hundred rubles, ready? Now, heads. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to tell you the answer to that one. <laughs> Let me explain what just went on. If I can make this thing work. Uh, is anybody here younger than 70? <laughs> Does anybody know how this thing actually... Okay. Right, so what we're going to cover here is what is risk, what types of risk, what is the context, and how is risk managed? So we just did a little episode here of heads and tails. Normally, by the way, if I keep that going for like seven, it just gets boring. But I can keep that going for seven throws. And with each throw, the number of people that want to bet on heads goes down and down and down until you've got one guy with his hand in the air. And the reason is that there's this pathetic fallacy, which the is... Fallacy. Sorry? The gambler's fallacy. Well, it's a fallacy because it's 50%. Now, of course, my 12-year-old, actually he's 13, my 13-year-old son points out that it depends how, it, how you flick it. But if, if you flick it perfectly, which I don't, 
If you flick it perfectly, it has a 50% chance of being heads or tails every time you flick it. But because we're all human, and because we're all victims of our past, we actually, if you see it being heads over and over again, eventually get to the point where you no longer believe that it's 50%. Well, of course, you might believe that it's a weighted coin. But the fact is that you are being ruled not by the actual probability, but your, by your perceived probability. And it's this business of perception that drives a lot of how we look at risk. Because you see, risk is something that exists everywhere. And how we perceive it is how we take that element of risk and internalize it. So, the first part of what we were doing was just out of interest. When I flipped the coin and said, is it heads or tails, and you said it's heads, it was intellectual interest. Was it heads, was it tails? It didn't affect you at all. That was just a question of probability. But once you create the, a financial interest in the outcome, oh, by the way, it could be that, you know, I had a, um, I was going to bring, I have, a, I have a fake gun that looks like a real gun, and then you play Russian roulette, you know. <laughs> and, then, and, and the concept there is that it may not have a financial outcome, but it will still affect you. <laughs> Get it wrong. But so you are interested in what is the outcome that's going to occur from taking that risk. And it must deal with this concept of loss before you enter into the realm of risk. Before that, you're talking about probability. After that, you're talking about risk. Any, any sort of comments on that? Do you, do you see, the, see where I am on that? Not really. What, you don't? OK, well, let me try again. <laughs> OK, for the guy in the middle, <laughs> who doesn't understand what I'm talking about, um, if you just have an action that occurs that you are intellectually interested but not involved with the outcome, you are not incurring risk because it's an observer sport. You can watch it happen. If it's heads, if it's tails, it doesn't make any difference to you. It has no impact on you. And you can talk about that in any of the risks that we're talking about. Where that risk, sorry, where that probability has an impact on you and your financial plan and your life and anything about your set of interests, it goes from being a, an, a spectator sport, just interesting, to, a, to risk, because in risk you have the potential of a downside and an upside. So that's the difference between, you know, a spectator sport, that like, you know, somebody shoots someone on TV, so what? Somebody shoots me, big deal. There's a risk in me being shot, there's not a risk in the guy shooting somebody on TV. Okay? Any other sort of uh, questions about that? Okay. Um, You know, when people talk about risk management, it, it always gets on my nerves a little bit because it's as though risk is a bad thing. And let me get it across to you that risk is a great thing. Without risk, you don't get return. And that risk and return equation may apply financially, it may apply to your life, it may apply to all sorts of things. But risk by itself is not a bad thing. And if you managed your life or your business to minimize your risk, the only thing I can tell you for sure is you're not going to be getting any returns. If you close the door, lock the door, draw the curtain, stay inside, and take no risk, well, actually, you're running another risk, which is probably you're going to die of hunger and boredom. <laughs> well, maybe boredom before hunger, I don't know. But the, 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 this concept that risk by itself is something to be avoided is wrong. The, the, the thing that you have to do is you have to maximize your risk in a way that you maximize your return for that amount of risk taken. So if you have additional risk, you should maximize its return. I, I'll, I'll try and make sure that I make this real for you so that I'm not just lecturing, because I'm not lecturing from a book, I can tell you. I'm lecturing from my life. And so let me give you an example of, of uh, risk that you take that you should understand before you take it. When I became chairman of Soyuz Bank, which is part of Deripaska's basic element group, I was basically a foreign banker in Russia. So I was basically a banker who had, well, I started Citibank here in 95, and then I'd been chairman of Delta Bank that was sold to GE Money in uh, 2000. 
But I'd never really been a Russian banker. I'd been a Western banker in a Russian bank working for foreign shareholders. I took over the Soyuz Bank uh, job basically with that mindset. I mean, not completely. And the moment the door swung closed behind me, I was the first foreigner CEO of a Russian bank for a Russian shareholder. And I can assure you that at the time I walked into that door, I had no concept, really, of the risks that I was about to encounter. Now, I'm certainly not going to breach any confidentiality, so if you think I'm going to tell you any really juicy stories, I'm sorry, you're wrong. But what I can tell you is that the chairman of a Russian bank covers, takes criminal responsibility for every action taken in that bank. Now, there's some of you that are lawyers, I guess. How many lawyers in the room? Ooh, good. <laughs> okay, so what is it? Why does the chairman of a Russian bank carry criminal uh, res uh, and civil responsibility for everything that happens? Anybody know? Anybody know why that's the case, legally? Anybody know how a Russian bank operates? Okay. What? Because of he something, then the shareholders are going to uh, Well, that's a possibility. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, and we'll talk about the... De and th there is an important discussion that goes on between the manager and the shareholder. The real issue in a Russian bank is that all operations in that bank, down to the guy, that down to the teller, come from an original power of attorney signed by the CEO, who is the ultimate authority in the bank, operating authority in the bank, and that uh, power of attorney, to be honest, goes from the CEO to the deputy CEOs, to the directors, to the heads of division, to the heads of units, all the way down to the guy who's operating the, the, the manual input for a funds transfer. So legally, any action taken by that bank finds its bloodline I'm, I'm not a, see, see, I'm not really a lawyer, finds its bloodline upwards to the CEO. So, whatever that's, that bank is doing, you are criminally responsible for. Now, I, I'm not, again, this is not a discussion of Soyuz Bank, but any large bank is bound to be involved in some things which could be misinterpreted. And, for instance, Soyuz Bank went from 700 people to 3,500 people in three and a half years. We grew from two offices, no, sorry, we grew from two, uh, three locations to 65 offices in 25 regions across Russia. Control processes had to be in place. There is no way that you can know what 3,500 people are doing, so you run risk. And as I walked through that door, in 2000, uh, March 2004, I did not understand the risks that I was taking. And therefore, <coughs> frankly, when I negotiated my remuneration, I did not maximize my return. Now, I have to say, in retrospect, I had three and a half years of intensive training on the Russian business environment, which very few other foreigners have been able to access. I mean, there are some but I had a tremendous opportunity to understand really how Russia works. And for that, I was more than amply compensated. But this issue of getting rewarded for the risk that you take is critical. And the critical part of it, as far as I'm concerned, is risk is not bad. So when somebody says to you, oh, how do you manage risk? The answer should be, well, I take as much risk as I think I can given the constraints and the considerations of the people that are involved in that discussion. And if you're running a business, it, it is pretty important to start off with an understanding between you and the shareholder. Because ultimately, if you are responsible for a business, you are responsible to the shareholder to maximize their return. If you go into that without that understanding, you can run into all sorts of misunderstandings. And so a very critical part of this risk management process is understanding what the parameters are. How much risk do they want to take? And I can tell you Mr. Deripaska can take a lot of risk. <laughs> and he's perfectly comfortable doing it. 
So it is it, the other thing that I would say is as you look at um, this risk question, it's important to understand the different perspectives. Because at different levels in the organization, starting with the shareholder, through the supervisory board, the board of directors, the chairman, and through each of the levels of management, there will be a different perspective of risk for each of those uh, constituents. So don't expect that there is one holistic risk management Bible that everybody reads from. You have to establish whose perspective you're dealing in, and you have to find a way of reaching an agreement for that. Let me give you an example. Managers can be highly motivated to take excessive risk if they feel in the short term they're going to make a bonus. I mean, if you look at some of the, 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 the commentary that comes out of how we're at this point in time where, frankly, we're all looking at a fair amount of risk out there, a big part of that is short-termism from people who were in a position to take risk who decided that the risk that they were taking would result in a significant benefit to them in the short term and perhaps were less worried about what impact that would have on the value on the firm long term. So if you get that uh, disconnect, then you end up with situations like the subprime market where investment bankers and loan originators were securitizing their product shooting it out the door and they didn't care really what happened in the long term to those loans because they weren't they, their feet weren't nailed to the risk and the risk was just moved on and somebody else was going to carry the can and they were going to take the bonus for that year and as you look at risk and return you have to also look at what motivates people let me just tell you something there's no such thing as business Okay? There's no such thing as business. What there is, there's a group of people in a room taking a decision. With other people in other rooms taking other decisions. And business doesn't exist in the ether. There's no business model that exists without the input. Well, you know, you could say, oh, how about these trading platforms? The hedge fund trading platforms, big black box humming away, making all sorts of trades. Well, it does that, and it does it off programs created by people. And it does it against risk management processes created by people. And it does it for shareholders who tend to be people. You know, even when that goes up through the line and you say, well, it's pension funds, well, pension funds become people. So ultimately, this business of business is simply a set of people making certain sets of decisions. And when certain things happen in business, you should always look at it through the uh, perspective of who were those people making those decisions at that point in time. Because just as you were beginning to not like the idea of a tails, because there have been too many tails before, the danger is in, in a business situation that people react because of their experience. And they may not react in the most logical way. And if you want a, a demonstration of that, you just have to look at what goes on every day in the marketplace. Stocks rally, stocks fall, and sometimes there's no economic motive behind that. It is a set of traders interacting with each other who uh, are using their personal uh, uh, experience and emotions to make business decisions. I'm doing, a, doing, a, doing some lecturing here, sorry about that. <laughs> um, any, any questions where we are so far? Anybody want to debate that issue about businesses only a set of people. Because it's taken me a while to realize that. And by the way, it, it's also important to remember that when you get into negotiations, there's a whole other conversation that we could have about how to negotiate. Anybody know what one of, yes? I got a question. Yeah. If there is no such thing as business, then what exists instead of it? No, it's, oh, it's, it is, the, I say it to say, I make the point to, to disaggregate it and say business as an entity doesn't exist without people. Oh, okay. So it isn't that there's no such thing as business. There's business. But the point that I'm making is if business 
is driven by people, and the people are driven by their past experience. So it doesn't... Uh, oh, something else, by the way. Um, in risk, and in, uh, and in any of these uh, interactions, A plus B does not necessarily become C. 1 plus 1 does not equal 2, necessarily. And there are what I call chemical <coughs> equations. They're not chemical, but they are equations where risks, one risk on top of another risk, isn't two risks. One risk on top of another risk could be two risks. One risk on top of another risk could be five risks. Because those risks interact with each other. And they spawn all sorts of other issues where you may forecast the next risk, but you might not forecast the risk after the risk after the risk. So if Greece defaults, the obvious thing is there's a bunch of Greeks who are going to have a problem. And then the ripple effect of all of that pops up in all sorts of odd places. Iceland. For, you know, somebody doesn't pay their mortgage in California and Iceland blows up. You know, how does that work? Well, it works because of all of these connectivity which occurs, as it were, under the, under the, under the radar. And you have to, in any of these risk management decisions, you have to look not just for the obvious risk, but for the risk after next. When I try to explain Russia to foreigners, it's always a bit of a, it's always an interesting issue explaining Russia to foreigners. Um, I say that there's three types of foreigner in Russia. There's the foreigner that gets off the plane in November or January. Oh my God! Where am I? You know, and it's minus twenty. You know, there's a, there's there, there are these funny signs that look of the pectopar. That's my first. Pectopar. Anybody know what pectopar is? It's what a restaurant. Restaurant. It's what a it's what a foreigner sees when they see restaurant, yeah. because that's what it says actually. Pectopar. And in fact, when I ran HSBC, I kept telling them that HSBC was NSVS, because HSV HSBC is N NSVS, as far as you're concerned. So yeah. Oh, hugely. I mean, if we just if we if we go to the point about business is only people, well, people are run by you know people are driven by psychology. Now, obviously, logic, logic and emotion live side by side in all of us, and there is a logical conclusion and an emotional conclusion, and so understanding how to m manipulate or how to read that combination is very valuable. But once you're dealing with the marketplace. The marketplace is so vast that there's no way you can personalize the psychology. You have to start looking for trends. And, uh, and of course, what's happening now, and, and I mean, I'd love to chat about what people think is about to happen now, but what's about to happen now is driven as much by psychology as it is by fact. And fear and previous experience has a major part in how people react. And I think that if you look at how Russia reacts to a crisis, the good news is that you're pretty good at crisis. You've had a lot of them. The 90s were full of them. You know, you know how to have a good crisis. And, and because of that, and because of this last 15 years, on the one hand, you are a hair trigger. You are on your, you're, you're, ready, you're ready to go, here goes the crisis. And that makes it quite difficult to manage. On the other hand, you also cycle information quite quickly. And that makes it possible for decision makers, particularly in a centralized decision making environment, which Russia is, to be able to react to developments. In the West, you know, they sit around, they rub, rub their hands, they've got the Republicans and the Democrats and everything, and here we go to the Kremlin and you're done. Well, Kremlin and the White House. Well, actually the White House. So you, you, you go, you basically, you have a center of decision making, and that allows you to cycle through this information very quickly. Just to get back to the foreigners a second, three types. Oh my God, it's cold. What are the, you know, the, what, what are these letters? I don't understand anything, um, and I don't know where I am. Okay, that's the natural first reaction. We all understand that. That's fine. The second type of foreigner is very dangerous. The second type of foreigner has been in the country for about two or three years, and now they know that Pektapar is restaurant, and they can say Dasvidaniya and you know, until they speak Russian, 
and they think they've worked it out. And those people are very dangerous because they misinterpret a lot of the signals that Russians are giving them. And they misinterpret some of the things that happen. The third type of foreigner, and I'm proud to be the third type, has been here long enough that we know that we'll never really understand you. <laughs> but we understand that we don't understand you. Uh, and that, allow, and that, gives us a sort of, that gives us a sort of heads up. And, I, and, and, and one, of the, one of the things that uh, I explain is, you know, Russians play chess. I play chess with my son, uh, my son lives in America, but I play chess when he's here, or when I'm with him, twice or three times a day. And chess is a Russian game because what happens on the surface isn't what's happening. So when the pawn moves, it's not the pawn you should worry about, it's the bishop or the horse. But it's not the obvious thing that's happening, it's what's going to happen several, several moves down the line. And I think that, that business of psychology, we were talking about psychology, the psychology varies by nationality. You know, I've lived and worked in 11 countries. Uh, if you want to know, England, Scotland, Kenya, Greece, Egypt, France, Norway, Italy, Russia, Puerto Rico, and America. And that gives me a pretty good sense of how nationalities vary. And, and the thing that I have found is, on the one hand, people are all the same all over the world and they react in certain ways. And on the other hand, people are extremely different and don't expect them to act the way they did in other places. Um, questions, comments, along the way? Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, in Russia, uh, we tend to, uh, we tend to uh, react to the crisis more quickly. Yeah. Because, in part, we do not have, uh, we do not have exactly a democratic system here. Yeah. Or do you suppose that uh, non-democratic countries can deal with crisis better than <coughs> <laughs> oh, oh, we could get into a long conversation, but we need a bottle of vodka. Sure. Uh, um, I, look, first of all, let me be clear. Um, I wasn't making, I mean, I was, okay, I was making some sort of side comment about the fact that here there is a very centralized power base. I, I'm not saying it's not democratic. Uh, I am saying it's centralized. And what I would say as well is, having run uh, a Russian organization, is Russians look for very strong leadership. It's a cultural background that you carry. It's neither good nor bad, it's the reality of the way that you react. It creates challenges for people as they try and delegate as a, as a leader. It has, it is built into the fabric. I think partly Russia needs a command and control uh, 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 environment because simply the size of it. And I think partly it is, uh, as I say, historical and cultural. But the thing that I have noticed, and I noticed this early on in, in the Russian bank, was you have to give very clear instructions. People want clear instructions from the leadership. Now, do I think that that makes it more, you know, it, it creates a better environment in a crisis? I've been a crisis manager, as I say, 15 years. When you come into a crisis, you have to do a certain set of things, and I'll talk about that in one of the sessions. But one of the things that you have to do is you have to be very clear and directive about what you want done. Because a fireman doesn't turn up at a fire and say, what do we all want to do? What should we do? And the fire is, you know, fire, you know, the fire is busy burning down the house. No, no, what do we all want to do? No, Jimmy, what do you want to do? No, no, no. You know, and, and so, I, and th this is, of course, this is not what you would be taught in management here. And I do not recommend this as something that you get involved with really in a normal course of business. I'm talking about very specific skill sets for very specific situations. And by the way, having been a crisis manager for 15 years, the reason I failed so terribly is that I couldn't move from being a directive crisis manager to being a leader. And the first time I turned up in my first leadership job, which was Citibank here, and if you dig up any of my old Citibank colleagues, please don't, but if you do, uh, they'll tell you that I, I appeared and I was still a crisis manager. And I couldn't make that move between being a crisis manager and being a leader. And it took me at least another two jobs before I got the point. So I don't recommend it as a style, I'm just saying that it is very effective. 
And so when you say, well, are non-democratic non better than democratic, I'm not going to answer that because that's, that's, uh, that's outside my job description. But what I will say is, in a crisis, it is very helpful to have very clear leadership. Um, okay, so, you know, this thing called risk is, uh, you, you've got to do some things around it. You've got to understand, as I was saying earlier, you know, we, we flip the, the coin and suddenly the experience of previous coin flips appears as something that will influence your decision going forward. So uh, experience is memory based. And, and the other thing is the memory, or we humans, like to make things make sense. We don't like things that don't make sense. So we tend to fit history into a pattern that we, we find acceptable. Why do you think of that? Why? Uh, it's because, you know, we're animals. It's, uh, we, we, like, we like our comfort zone. We like to be in an environment which we can understand and react to. If you inject chaos and you take away normal conditions, humans become extremely, they, the, what I call the rabbit in the headlight. You know, and I, I've personally experienced this. When I was in Kenya, in uh, August 1982. Where were you all in August 1982? I know where you were. <laughs> in the making. Yeah, in the making. A glint in your mother's eye or your father's eye. So, no, in, in August 1982, I was told, I was a corporate bank head in Kenya. I was told that Kenya was the safest country in Africa. And as I drove home from the nightclub at three in the morning, people waved at me, so I waved back. And then I noticed they were waving guns. <laughs> and, and so I stopped waving at them. And uh, at that point, uh, what happened was that the world that I had understood, everything that I'd understood within, you know, running a business in Citibank in Africa, went out the window. Because there was a new set of circumstances. And you need to, you need to adjust. And people have difficulty, you know, adjusting to completely new sets of circumstances. And so generally, people find chaos very difficult to, to operate in. It turned out that I, I had a great time in chaos, so that's why I stayed as a, risk, as a crisis manager. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I'd like to point out is risk does not exist in a vacuum. Y your business, your set of decisions, you know, you, d you don't get to sit in a classroom in real world and make a decision without other things happening. Everything that you're doing happens in a competitive environment. Means any decision you take, your competitor, if they take a different decision to yours, will either benefit or will suffer. But you don't, you don't control your competitor. So when you make that decision not to take risk and your competitor takes the makes the decision to take risk, don't be surprised if you lose your customer base. Don't be surprised if you lose market share. Uh, an, an easy example of that is consumer credit in Russia in 2000. Delta Bank was one of the, the, start, one of the uh, pioneers of consumer credit. And when we started, we didn't have credit bureau information. We didn't have clarity. We, didn't have, we had a scoring model, but frankly, it was a sort of, you know, you, you put in numbers and numbers came out, but there was no reality to the model because there was no access to a lot of the hard data. And we had to make a decision. Do we take this risk and take market share, or do we stay conservative and wait for the information to become more transparent? Well, my, anal my analogy there was, when, you, when you're in the Arctic, if you go early, you don't have pack ice, but you also maybe not know, you don't know all the details. If you go later and the pack ice is there, well, you may know more of the details, but it'll be much harder to drive through the market share. So any decision that you make about how much risk you're going to take is built around these other decisions, which is what does it cost to take market share? Because in a very mature market, taking market share is a very expensive business. Marketing, advertising dollars, PR dollars, access to your customer, customer loyalty, all of these things are very expensive. And if you've held back from taking that risk, and your competitor has established that customer loyalty, pulling the customer out from 
somebody else and establishing your, your, your customer from somebody else's customer base is a very complicated process. So when I say here that uh, it doesn't take place in a vacuum, it means that you have to look across, look sideways and work out what your competitors are doing. Because otherwise you may take your decisions and not realize the impact it will have on your business as a result of either macro uh, environment or industrial developments or your competitors. Uh, the future, who, who knows what a black swan is? Black swans, one person, two people, three people, but not enough. So let me explain what black swans are. Um, there's a guy called Nassim Taleb who uh, wrote a book a little while ago and he came up with the sexy term black swans. I mean, frankly, he'd had the theory for some time and then he came up with a sort of groovy uh, name for it and then everybody suddenly talks about black swans. Black swans in the 19th century uh, uh, in Europe didn't exist. Nobody had seen a black swan in Europe, so all swans were white. And then when they went to Australia, some guys ran across a black swan. And suddenly, the concept that swans are always white had to change. And the concept behind black swans, and I've also got a piece on that that we can go through, is that a black swan event is something that cannot be predicted that has a major and significant, a significant impact on the environment, but it cannot be predicted. An example of that is that in the year 2000, if you traveled on a plane with a small knife, you were a person on a plane with a small knife. In 2002, if you traveled on a plane with a small knife, you were a hijacker. And until that event in 2001 had occurred, that risk had not been identified. And the moment that risk had occurred, it was suddenly a new risk in the dictionary. It is the unknown unknowns, which is uh, something that we need to talk about, how you manage the unknown unknowns. Okay, I'm, uh, so pr predictability is a whole issue about how, how you can take your past experience and project it forward and how, in situations where you can't take your past experience, you manage your way forward. And we'll talk about that. How much time do I have, by the way? Five hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll, yeah, fine. I mean, I'll do this for as long as I'm feeling comfortable. Don't forget I'm coming back, so... Um, uh, but, you know, we'll do it for another hour, at least, if, if that's okay. If you if you're anybody that's sort of you know bored or wants to leave, just get up and leave. So don't worry about me. Um, what type of risks are there? This is where you do the hard work. I don't. I don't have a a whiteboard, but uh, I have a piece of paper. Okay, this is where I take names. No, I don't take names. This is where I'm listening for the sort of risks there are in the world. What are the risks in the world? What are the risks? Well, no, 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 that's a, that's a, okay, tornado is an event, I agree with you. I'm talking about business now, by the way. A tornado could be an environmental effect. A tornado would, in fact, be an unpredictable external environmental risk. So that's one. Actually, by the way, that's one I haven't had before. <laughs> well done. Come on. Political risk. What's a political risk? Revolution. Revolution. Well, it can be, it doesn't have to be a revolution. It can be a, a, a change in trade policy, it can be a change in customs duties, it can, be, you know, it can be a lot of things caused by a change in politics. Or in fact, as we're seeing now, it can be a lot of things generated by the fact that political factors prevent decisions from taking place. I mean, that's what we're seeing in the European Union. That's what we're seeing in America. We're seeing situations where politics are causing a logjam. So actually, it is in, 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 in that situation, politics prevents things happening. It doesn't enable things happening. So a revolution means something changes. But politics can also be where it prevents anything from changing because everything's in a logjam. So political risk, definitely. What about so hang on one at a time. <coughs> what? Okay. Couldn't hear you. Investment. investment risk. Define investment risk. What is investment risk? <laughs> well, geez, okay. Well, you know, hey, let's throw out a name and see if he knows. Uh, 
the financial risks. Okay, hang on, financial risks. Uh, actually, just to be fair, uh, investment risk is a risk. Of course it's a risk. It's a, it's, but it, it is bound into other risks. So we'll get back to that. Financial risk. What, what, sort of, what is a financial risk? What's a, what sort of financial risk can you have? Well, there is a variety of such risks. I guess um, a lot of them are associated with uh, leveraging your business. Yeah. Some are associated with uh, the actions of your shareholders, yeah. uh, their demands, yeah. the business. Uh, some are associated with, with uh, risk investments. Yeah. Okay, well listen, financial risk is exactly as you say, it exists all over the place. You can define financial risk as leverage, you can, do, do, you can define it as, as t terms of trade. You, you know, money is the lubricant of business. Money is fu fungible. You know, f money, whenever people talk about, oh, bank debt this and, and customer uh, uh, supplier credit that, actually when you're running a business, all of this stuff is just, it's like your blood. It's, it's the stuff you need to keep the organism moving. And you can take your blood from the suppliers, you can take your blood from the customers by causing them to pay you cash when you pay your suppliers on credit, or you can, pay, you can take that blood from banks because you, know, you can borrow money from the banks that finances your trade cycle. All of these things, but they're all fungible, means that you know, it's like, um, it's like uh, you know, pulling different stops on an organ. You, know, you make the music, but you make it with different parts of the organ. So the fact that you're using supplier credit versus bank credit carries certain risks in the supplier credit that it doesn't in the bank credit. So financial risk, yep. There's more. Do we speak of competition risks? For yes, there's yeah. industry competition risk, yep. There's only, there's only two guys answering the questions here. Come on, guys. But you're not allowed anymore. <laughs> What? Come here. Any more risks? Operational risks? Yes, of course. A big old risk. What is operational risk? Well, I believe it's a decision to build some way of plan that proved to be wrong. It's an operational risk, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, operational risk is a very, it's a bit like financial. It covers a lot of issues. Operational risk are all of the risks that occur as a result of operations. Um, now, I mean, I teach uh, uh, a case on uh, Challenger and uh, Columbia. Anybody know what Challenger and Columbia were? The yeah, the, the shuttles. One blew up on the way up, one blew up on the way down. Both blew up for operational reasons that could have been dealt with. One of them because the rings froze at low temperatures and weren't supple and therefore the uh, fuel ignited, and one of them because tiles fell off on the way up, but because tiles fell off before on the way up, and because people were you know, influenced by their past, they didn't think it was uh, uh, relevant, so that when it came down, it blew up. These are operating risks. Well, actually, in those cases, there are also organization, oops, I've given it away, organizational risk. Organizational risk is when you design an organization that doesn't function properly. Organizations require, you, you know, when you have an organization, it needs to operate in a certain manner. Organizations, again, are just this group of people talking to each other. So if you don't set up the organization in a way that is efficient, where communication lines work, you end up with a, you, you can have all the brightest, the way I describe it is NASA did not sit down with a bunch of stupid people and work out how to blow up rockets. You know, they didn't sit in a room and say, how do we cause these rockets to blow up and kill people? They had, they had a bunch of smart people and they all thought they were doing the right thing, but the trouble was that the way the organization was set up, it didn't allow the one guy in the back row who understood what the issue was to raise it in such a way that it got dealt with. So organizational risk is a very major risk. I can hear a lot of muttering, but I can't hear any exact suggestions. Decision-making risk. No. <laughs> but legislation. Yeah, of course. Legal risk. A legal and regulatory risk. 
law, law, any legal environment will influence the risk that you take. Either the law works or the law doesn't work. Either the law protects the creditor or it protects the debtor. Either the law is, it protects intellectual property or it allows intellectual property to be stolen. But however you look at it, dealing with legal and regulatory risk is critical. If regulations change, you have to change with them or you get closed down. What I used to say in the bank was, we have the right to come in and turn on the electricity only if the central bank tells us to, tells us that we are authorized to do so. So you better make sure that the regulator itself is uh, comfortable with what you were. And I'll give you an example of how you can get that wrong. In 95, I was sent here to run Citibank. I didn't think Russian accounting standards was anything I should really worry about. So I kept reporting Citibank's numbers through their financial through their, their systems until one day the central bank turned up on our door and said, where are your Russian accounting standards and your Russian accounting for the last three years? Well, I didn't have it. Actually, at that point, I was out of the country. And for two years, I was on a uh, list at the airport that would have gone straight to jail if I'd come back to Moscow. Luckily, Citibank fought the case, and as a result, uh, I'm still here. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the point was that you, you, you are in any country that you are in, in any legislative environment that you're in, pay attention to that legislative environment because they control what you are allowed to do. So legal risk is a very important one. For all you lawyers, shame on you. It should be number one. Uh, okay. how, in, how in the Russian environment political risks came up first? Just because, well, I don't know, and I'm not going to talk about that. Exchange rate risk. Well, exchange rate risk is a financial risk. Of course, it's a risk. You know, any one of these risks, you can start to break down, and you can break them down into all sorts of categories. And we can do that. You know, I do that in the, one of the courses I teach. I can go in, in uh, horrible detail into the types of financial risk you can take, and foreign exchange is definitely one. And within foreign exchange, you can then start talking about cross-currency. You can start talking about interest rate risk. You can, you know, you can go on about it. Foreign currency, foreign exchange risk, for instance, any, any, uh, any business entity that operates with any external input is taking foreign exchange risk, whether it wants to or not. If you buy foreign, if you buy raw materials, even if you buy them in rubles, you take foreign exchange risk because your supplier is exposed to foreign currency. If you're selling, if you sell to a, any overseas sales, you're taking currency risk. If your, pro, if your commodity is priced in a third currency like oil, you take foreign exchange risk. Uh, so foreign exchange risk is a very major part of this, and then you have to talk about. Then you have to talk about how do you, how do you hedge? When do you hedge? Is a risk out there a risk that you can absorb, or is it one that you should hedge? And we can talk about that in detail. Okay. So any more? <coughs> any more? Any more? What about crime and litigation risks. Uh, uh, crime and litigation. Yes, like fraud. It's that's legal. Sure. It's legal. Uh, it, th there's something else that's in there, though, which is um, fraud equals people, and people equals risk. Uh, you, you run a major risk. There's the, the, the di different angles on uh, uh, people risk. There's a people risk because you don't have the right people, and they're incompetent, and so as your business grows, they don't know what to do. And then, then you have other people risk where they're criminal, and they conduct fraud, and all the risk uh, all, you know, UBS just got taken to the cleaners, you know, in, in London, you know, it, there's no system in place that can beat fraud, because normally fraud is, t is actually uh, people using the, 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 the systems against the organization. And, and I'd love to, you know, I'd love to also sort of spend another two hours talking to you about how do you judge people. Um, I'm just going to spend a minute on it because I feel like it. Uh, you know, if you're a banker, one of the principal uh, skills that you have to have is an ability to assess uh, people, to assess management, to assess your borrower, to know whether or not when they say one thing they mean it, if they're going to carry through, how they're going to react to stress. Because in any situation, people can operate well in a benign environment. The issue is, can they operate well in a stressed environment? And, funny, and it's a funny thing. People, uh, the quiet people who you think 
won't react well, react well, and the people who you think, the ones that are always banging their chest and saying how strong they are, they collapse. And you have to be able to tell one from the other. So one of the things, and, and one of the, the great things about being a banker <laughs> is you look over everybody's garden gate. By which I mean that as a banker, as a general banker, corporate banker, I have dealt with pretty much every industry all over the world. And, and that means that when I'm standing in the front of a killing line in an abattoir, or I'm uh, on a film production set, or I'm uh, watching grass grow in some farm, I have to, I mean, all of those industries are completely different. But the one thing that's the same is that good people with, with uh, the right attitude and the right ethics run their business well. And the other side of that is bad people without ethics don't. So you have to d develop this sixth sense. So during the last crisis, and I'm running HSBC, and at that point I have uh, sort of 32 years 33 years of banking experience. Unlike my father, my father was a GP, and he practiced until he was 83. By the time he finished, apart from the fact that we were always worried that he didn't see them, you know, but by the, by the time he finished, he almost didn't have to physically examine people because he could tell by the way they walked and the color of their skin and so forth. He could be able to, you know, he was able to diagnose a lot of illnesses. And by the time you've been doing this for 32 years, it shouldn't take that much time to be able to assess people. And this is a story I told the account officers uh, at HSBC. And so it was time for me to go and assess uh, a business that was having a bit of trouble in St. Petersburg. I get on the plane, I get down there, I have lunch with the CFO. Now, how you run a, a meeting about assessing somebody else is also uh, a set of skills that you develop over time. You have to make the person relaxed. You have to put them at their ease. You then have to ask what I would call uh, triangulating questions. You know, if you try and go on a, an El Al plane anywhere, they, they, there will be two sets of people that ask you the same question in different ways, and then they will compare their notes to make sure that actually what you're saying is the truth. And what you do, and one of the things that you pick up as a senior banker, is that you ask the same question but in different ways, in a way that if the person's lying, they're going to trip. I used all my skill, my 32 years of skill. I came away, I wrote a memo, I said, this is a guy, he's not terribly exciting, but he's a decent guy who's trying to run his business the best he can in difficult circumstances. As I was having lunch with the guy, he was stealing $10 million off me and $10 million off another six foreign banks. He had understood exactly what foreign bankers were looking for and he played it back to us. So he knew exactly that he was meant to be a low-key guy and that he was trying hard and all of these things. He was a perfect actor, and he got me in the neck. And the moral of the story is never get comfortable. I mean, it doesn't mean to say that I, I'm not fairly good at what I do. It just means to say never be surprised when somebody catches you out, because they, they may well. It was, very, it was a very helpful reminder, by the way. Okay, here are some of the ones I could think of. Industry risk is if you're in the if you're in the horse and carriage business in uh, the 1900s, business is probably pretty good. You know, if you're in the in the buggy whip business, you know the whips that used to keep the horses going on buggies. Probably you've had a great year, but your industry is about to change, and if you don't understand what the what the elements of that change are and you don't adjust you're going to go bankrupt. So industry changes, industry developments, developments that cut across economies on an industry basis have a very major impact. We've talked about political. Company risk, it's actually, I'm not sure I understand. I wrote it, but I'm not sure what I meant. Um, company risk is where you have an entity where there are risks within the way that company itself is set up. It, it's a sort of aggregation of these other risks, but it's localized to what is happening inside that company. Uh, I'll give you an example. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's tied to technological. There was a sugar trader in, in America that I used to deal with who put in a new technology system. And suddenly, they went from not knowing very much to knowing everything. But the problem was that they knew everything. So actually, instead of having a few statistics, they knew every single you know, bundle of, of sugar 
that got loaded all the way from Australia to Canada. And it was just too much information. And so as they moved from a situation where they didn't know very much to where they knew everything, they didn't know how to handle... Information is only useful if you have a way of using it. Information by itself doesn't do anything. It's the information and how relevant it is and how you use it that counts. So in this case, the, uh, the, there was a specific company problem, which was a management problem related to a technological problem. We talked about financial, operational. Management itself is an issue, obviously. Uh, uh, any, it, it, when you do any risk analysis, one of the things you need to do is you need to do an inventory of, of management. Now, inventories of management are, are quite simple to do. But you have to start by saying, what are the skills that you need and what are the experience base of the people that you have in front of you? And you have to align experience with responsibility. If you have somebody that's extremely good at one particular part of the business running another part of the business, it can be a risk. Of course, the problem with this is, or the fact is, that good people get promoted into positions where they may not have the skills that are necessary. And there will always be a learning period. And then the question is, how flexible are they? Can they learn on the job? Have they learned from the past? Can they take the experience of one sector and move it into another? But an inventory of management is extremely important. If you took over a company tomorrow, what would be the first thing you did? Oh, no, no, no. Change? Did you, who was that? Oh, change. Okay, so you, so you're the shareholder. You buy a company, you get rid of the CEO, and you put in your CEO, and you yeah. change the whole board of directors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, ruthless. <laughs> um, I mean, of course you do. Of course, on one level you do. You put in your person, and by the way, you put in your person and let that person change the board. You you don't put in the board around them. You you put your if you're going to take over a business and you're going to give it to a chief executive, you might put in one or two board members around them to act as independent directors to make sure you know what they're doing. But you have to let them make their board decisions, otherwise they, can't, they don't have a team. Building a team is a very complicated process. When I took over Soyuz Bank, I replaced the full team. But of course, you know, it's not that easy. It isn't that you can just wave a wand unless, unless you have a team with you. And of course, some people carry teams with them, you know, so that you, they can take one group the retail head, the corporate bank, the risk manager, everybody, and you pull them out of one organization, like uh, VTB did out of Deutsche, you pull it out of one and you stick it into another and you've got the organization. But that's unusual. Normally what you do is you go in and you take control and then you take the pressure points. You take the key roles first. You can't change everybody all at once because physically you can't do it. You know, for every person you're going to hire, you're going to have to meet 15. For every 15 people, you're going to have to do research. All of these things take time. So you have to, to layer. You have to layer the changes in management. So the CEO goes in, he'll change the CFO, he'll probably change the head of you know the head of the biggest business unit and probably the head of operations, and then he'll probably put in an audit committee. And so there is a certain sequencing. And you do end up, not necessarily, by the way, the best people in a team are the ones you keep from the old team who get the new team because they're so grateful that they're still around. The people you don't want and the people that you take out and fire day one are the people who are going to say no no matter what you do. You know, there are people when you take over a team who are simply going to, to, to wait and say everything that you do is wrong and spend as much time in passive or active resistance and you have to get rid of them. I can't tell you how many times I got that wrong where I thought that I, sh I should be able to find a way to work with them and ultimately, in some teams, there are people that you will never be able to work with, and you better get rid of them early on. We can deal with that in, in leadership if we uh, get that far. Uh, reputational. Reputational. Anybody got any thoughts about reputational risk? Why is that a problem? Well, to get to deal with, um, to work at the market, to get to deal with customers. Um, so customers, for customers. Win their loyalty. By what you say you are. You, by being what you say you are. Yeah. You have to walk the walk. And, 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 uh, reputation is a very important thing. By the way, can I just make, can I, sorry, I just, 
because I, I want to make something, a very important point to each and every one of you. Your reputation and your integrity is something that you will build in a lifetime and lose in a day if you're not careful. Reputation is something, integrity is something that is not negotiable. If you think that you can sort of have integrity, and I know that this is Russia and I know it's complicated and you don't have to tell me about it, I've been here 16 years, I know that. But you have to establish your own personal integrity and your own personal sense of self and stay with it. Because it isn't something you're going to be able to put back together again if you break it. I'm, I'm sorry, I, there's, I mean that's my opinion. And everybody has to, and of course you're going to make mistakes, like I said earlier. You know, make mistakes often, quickly, and learn. <coughs> but try whatever you can to make sure that you keep your personal integrity as it is. And then you will end up with a reputation. Because over time, people will understand who you are. And uh, I think that that business of reputation, and, that, and, and let's take it away from people for a moment, let's talk about companies. Building a reputation as a company requires you to do a whole bunch of things. You have to have great customer service. You have to deliver what you say you will deliver on time. You have to fulfill that promise that you make every time you go out and make that sale. You have to create continuity in your business. And when you create marketing campaigns, like HSBC's marketing campaign, of a bank of high integrity, you cannot afford a headline that takes away from it. Citibank, which was run by John Reed during the time I was there, had an unassailable reputation for always respecting the country in which it operated. When it merged with Travelers and Sandy Weil, two big companies came together, and the commitment to the country franchise was diluted somewhat. And as a result, the company suffered some significant issues in different franchises, Japan as an example, but several others, where the business manager had put the business ahead of the franchise. And you can always make a bit more money. But if you make that money at the cost of your franchise, going back and rebuilding your franchise is extremely difficult. Extremely difficult and potentially impossible. So reputational management is probably one of the core critical success factors of any business. Um, sort of linked to that is PR risk. PR risk and reputational, not quite the same thing. PR risk is where an event occurs and you don't get ahead of that event. If you have an event, an oil spill in Mexico, look at, look at the chairman of BP at that time. The guy was working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and at some, in some television interview, he said, I just want to get my life back. Because he's a human, and he was tired, and he was fed up with people sticking cameras in his face. And that's what he felt. I just want to get my life back. Well, 55 people died on the oil rig. Hundreds of thousands of livelihoods were at risk because of the oil. And there's the chairman saying he just wants to get his life back. It is the unguarded moment. And when, as a chairman of a bank, you go into a press conference, if you're any good at what you do, you spend days, if it's a major, risk, uh, major conference, you spend days with your team where they come up with the worst questions that they can think of, and you have to come up with the best answers that don't cause that story to continue. If you're too evasive, if you're too cute, it will come out. So you have to be honest in communication, but you have to steer the communication in a certain way. Again, I can spend a whole bunch of time on that, but it's, we probably don't have it for, for these couple of hours. Um, corruption risk, environmental risk, I'd say. Uh, environmental, the environment in which you operate. Okay, so um, let's take a little pause. Any comments, questions? You're all very quiet. <laughs> I mean, is this what you want to know about, or do, should we talk about some other things? I don't know, I can't judge.
Do you, what, what would you actually? Let, let, before I get into this, what would you like to talk about? Here I am. Yeah. How do you become a CEO of one of the major banks in the world? Well, I wasn't the CEO. Well, I. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you okay. were. No, no. I was a, I was middle level management in Russia. Uh, no, I wasn't. No, I was senior management in Russia, middle level in the. In, Okay, so um, how do you how so the question really is if you want to define that how do you become successful in your career, or specifically how do you become CEO of a bank in Russia? Right after you graduate. What? Right after you graduate? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's the other. Why thing. do you like Russia so much? Why do I like Russia so much? But can I do that one first? <laughs> um, okay, it's very simple. It isn't simple at all. Um, <laughs> first of all. Russia is a country that contains incredible contrasts. Uh, it, it is, it's, a, it's a schizophrenic country. It's hard. It has hard winters and, and hot summers. It has hard people with soft centers. It has a terrible history with a, with, a, with a love of culture. It is not one thing. The thing about Russia is you can't define it in any one terms because it contains, in my, in my experience, these juxtaposed, very different environments. It has a 15-year history in a, in, a, in a historical country. So on one level, if you cut the slice one way, you say capitalism, 15, 20 years. If you cut it another way, well, actually, this was an industrialized nation because of, uh, because of communism. It was one of, the, one of the most industrialized nations quickly during the 20th century. Of course, it wasn't necessarily done in the most efficient way, but you have this this, this very strange mixture of the new and the old. It has culture, the depth of which I'm, I've been very fortunate. For 15 years, I've been supporting the Gnesin School. And Mikhail Hoklov, who's the maestro there, is a friend of mine. And he allows me to go and sit inside the student orchestra and listening, listen to them practicing Shostakovich. Well, you only have to do that a few times and you understand the depth of the culture that's in the, in the country. So. The history, the culture, the people, the country, and then the business opportunities. The business opportunities in this country, because you are still at that in a forming stage, because it still hasn't, you're not in, you're not dealing with one percent market share. You're still in the in the in the in the in the period where you're growing. As an outsider, which I am, I can participate in the country in a way that I have significant input, which I would certainly not have in my own country, nor any other mature country. So the opportunity space is also significant. I can do that for hours, by the way, but I'm going to move on. But I really, you know, you know congratulations on a wonderful country, history, um, and people, because uh, you have it. Um, so wh where were we? We were somewhere else. We were talking about success. That's right, success. OK. Um, Learn something and learn it well. Don't think you're going to get there by spin. If you don't acquire the skills, you won't. The, all the spin in the world won't get you where you want to go. So, point number one would be: be good at your current thing. Be so good that you're better than everybody else, and spend the time acquiring the skills. Second, make yourself very available to others. Don't be a star. Don't be a star because stars burn out. I know I was a star. For five years, I was the lead corporate finance guy in the London market. I wore braces, smoked cigars, I drove an Aston Martin, and I burned out. And I can tell you that anything that where you look at those cool guys going by, you know, the danger with that is they look cool when they go by, and then they go by. And what you should be planning, a friend of mine says, play the long run, don't play the short run. I know that this is Russia, and I know that the horizons are short, and I know there's a tendency to want everything to be done as quickly as possible. But if you can pace yourself, you'll find that actually I think that the life is more interesting. It, life is a race, but you should, you should pace yourself. And then finally, I think that uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you say specifically, how did I end up in this position, it is that I dealt with some of the worst situations Citibank had to offer for 15 years. And if you deal with the worst, they figure that you could manage the upside. So uh, always look, in my opinion, always look for difficult things to do. Don't take the easy things because that won't, it's like, you know, working out in the gym. You know, do the thing that causes you the maximum exercise, 
because if you have the maximum exercise, you'll get the maximum uh, payback. I have a feeling. Are, are you here because I'm meant to finish at 5:20? Well, I mean, you have five minutes left. I have five minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to go on till six, but uh, well, you know. Uh, so I'll just. This will just be. This will just be a teaser. Then here's a little teaser. You know. You know. It's like in any of these uh, series on TVs. I'm, I'm watching uh, Breaking Bad, which is. A, anybody seen Breaking Bad? Such a great series, um, and it always leaves you just at the point where everything's falling apart. Okay, okay. I'm just going to talk about what is a crisis, and then next time, uh, which is in a week's time, I guess, is that right? A week. Um, in a week's time, I'll talk about how to deal with it. So. Oh, this isn't defining features of a crisis. This is, uh, uh, this is how to deal with the crisis. I don't like this slide. <laughs> okay, I'm out. I don't know. I don't know. I wrote it, but I don't like it. Um, let, me just, let, let me just paint the scene, first of all, and then, we'll, we'll, and then I'll come back next week and, and we'll deal with how to deal with that. A crisis is a situation in which the past is not a predicator for the future. A crisis is a situation in which events move fast enough that any one decision can have a dramatic impact on the future. A crisis is a situation in which stress is injected into a normalized environment, causing, for which, remember, business is just people, businesses to react in unexpected ways. A crisis is the appearance of risks previously uncharted. And if you are to be successful in that sort of an environment, you have to develop certain, certain characteristics and certain habits on how you adjust to that environment. And if you want to know what those characteristics and habits are, You'll have to come back next week. <laughs>